So good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Sebastian Koeskin. Is it too loud? No? OK. Uh, that's the last talk, I guess, uh, before lunch. And that's only the second talk of the, the serverless track. So I think you know, thanks to all the members of the, the serverless working group. I think they've done a, a great job. And thanks for uh, the setup uh, you know, to talk about uh, serverless. Uh, so I work at Bitnami. I'm the, the Kubernetes lead there for all the things that, uh, that we do related to Kubernetes. We work a lot uh, upstream, and, uh, and we contribute quite a bit to, uh, to the open source uh, ecosystem. I was actually at the first KubeCon in San Francisco, and there, it was a little bit bigger than this in the hotel. It was like 400 people. So it's actually very overwhelming to see 4,000 people uh, in, the, in a keynote uh, the last few days. Uh, but I want to talk about building serverless application pipelines. Okay, and I'm not gonna, you know, go deep into uh, introducing, you know, what I've done before. But stop by the booth at 4:30. I actually co-wrote the Kubernetes cookbook for O'Reilly. We have 25 uh, galley copy unedited, so stop by the booth and get uh, get your copy of the of the Kubernetes cookbook. Okay, and that will be the the free uh, the free swag. Uh, so building, building application pipelines, uh, everybody has its own definition of, uh, of serverless and its own reason of why they want to use serverless. Uh, for me, the, the, the main reason is really about building apps and building distributed apps. So that's why uh, you know, I want to talk about today and also explain you know, how we use Kubeless to be able to, uh, to build those application pipelines. Uh, so what, what is serverless? Well, the working group has done an amazing job. Uh, you know, definitely, you should go read the, uh, the white paper. So the, the CNCF serverless working group has defined serverless like this. Uh, you know, computing refers to the concept of building and running apps that do not require server management, basically. And it's really a fine-grained you know, way of, of deploying business logic and then monitoring that little business logic and paying for just those calls of that business logic, okay? So it's a you know, very, very nice way to go really fine grain in, uh, in writing your app and then you know, paying and deploying it. Uh, of course, you know, uh, there are servers. So that's an old tweet from, uh, from last year, actually, from, uh, from the serverless conference in Austin. There is no serverless. It's just someone else fully managed execution environment that I only pay a fraction of a cent for whenever my function is run. So the, you know, I know some the AWS guys were quite vocal into you know, what is serverless and what is not serverless and what is fast. And their point was, you know, if you're in a public cloud and you're a client, a customer of the public cloud, and you're deploying functions, you don't have to manage those servers, so it's serverless. If you're using something like Kubeless or Fission, you know, one of the, the, the solutions that you can deploy on-prem, you still have to manage those servers, so it's not serverless, it's fast, okay? But personally, you know, spending a lot of time on the, on the definition, I think we, you know, we lose time actually trying to figure out, you know, what is this paradigm, that, this new paradigm that we have to actually build apps? So let, let's figure out, you know, how we, how we build apps. Uh, I totally stole those, uh, those little diagrams from, uh, from Lambda, uh, because, you know, Lambda is actually arguably these days, you know, Again, the, the leader in, um, uh, in serverless uh, out there in the public cloud. So when you, what, what they, how the way they explain Lambda is basically you have your little business logic, your little bit of code, and then you upload that through the CLI. And then that bit of code is triggered by something. That's a major point, I think, when we are talking about those application pipelines, is that we have those event sources that were mentioned in the previous talk. So we have those event sources somewhere in our system and it's those event sources that are going to trigger those, uh, those methods, right, those, those functions. So in Lambda, you, you have those, uh, those little functions. You bundle them in a zip file. You upload them to, uh, to AWS. You define what triggers those calls. And then, you know, basically, they're going to be uh, run on demand. And, uh, and you, you get paid for, you know, the number of times you, uh, you call them. Uh, I'll, ju I'll just, you know, bounce back on a, a question about, you know, is, is serverless actually auto-scaling or uh, uh, because, you know, there's this time of, of starting the app and so on. So at the beginning of serverless, I think there was lots of people that were saying, well, what's your cold start? What's your warm-up start and so on? And then, you know, six months ago, we actually started seeing users of Lambda trying to optimize this time, and they were faking calls to functions so that their Lambdas would stay up. So they were doing pre-warm-up, okay? 
and they were keeping their warm. So you're kind of defeating the purpose of saying, you know, my function is going to go up and down really quickly, and I'm only paying for, you know, what I use. So we have to take all of this with a grain of salt when we say, well, are you shutting down the function, and how fast are you provisioning it? Because depending on your app and, and the, the, the traffic of your events, you may actually have to keep them warm. Keep them warm. Sorry, French accent. Uh, so what AWS CLI looks like this: Lambda create function, region give a function name, specify a, a zip file, a runtime, which is the, the language, and so on. Google Cloud function is very similar. Uh, Azure actually I haven't tried, but you know Azure, uh, Microsoft has Azure functions. OpenWhisk also. So all those solutions have, of course, a CLI, and. I'll get back to it because Kelsey this morning totally inspired me after two minutes. He said something which is, you know, we don't want to use the CLI. And I was like, ah, he's right. We don't want to use the CLI. Because I was preparing for demos for this. And I was like, this CLI is really long. There is no way I'm going to demo this, right? <laughs> even, even with Kubeless, if I have to type all of this, it's going to be super boring. Uh, but that's basically uh, AWS. So if you're trying to, to build those, uh, those apps, what what serverless solutions do you have out there? You know, you have Lambda, you have Google Cloud Functions, Azure, IBM OpenWhisk, I should say Apache OpenWhisk, actually. Uh, you have FN from Oracle, OpenFAS, and then, you know, Bitnami, we're pushing Kubeless, which is fully open source, uh, you know, out there. So I'm going to talk about Kubeless and, and show it you. So who is using Kubeless? I'm super excited today to say that, you know, SAP is evaluating and, and planning to contribute to, uh, to Kubeless. That's in bold, and that's exactly the sentence that the lawyers allowed us to, uh, to put on the slide. <laughs> I hope that the next KubeCon, uh, you know, we, we'll have some, uh, some more. And then I'm also super excited because BlackRock is here today, and, uh, and they're users of Kubeless. That's also what was uh, allowed by uh, the uh, corporate communication team, but we have uh, Arjun here, Rao, and he's going to join me at the end of the talk to, uh, to talk a little bit about how they use Kubeless uh, at, uh, at BlackRock in their Kubernetes uh, cluster. So I'm pretty, pretty stoked about what's, uh, what's happening with those you know, real enterprise uh, users. So, you know, we, so we see Lambda and Kubeless started last year after KubeCon where people were talking a lot about serverless and I, and I was like, well, we have Kubernetes. Kubernetes is the perfect platform to build systems on top of, okay? It has a super rich API, it's extensible, you know, if we are going serverless right away, we should actually be able to build a serverless solution on top of Kubernetes, okay? So that's what Kubeless is. It's a really Kubernetes native serverless solution. What I mean by Kubernetes, Kubernetes native is that we actually extend in Kubernetes. It's not a solution that we have containerized and that we deploy on top of Kubernetes. It's an extension of Kubernetes. And Hen Goldberg earlier in the, the keynote mentioned it as a, an extension. Who is familiar with custom resource definitions? There you go. So Kubeless is using custom resource definition and it's a controller. It's actually pretty simple when you, know, when you uh, think about it. But we, we use the Kubernetes API server. We don't have our own API server, so we reuse the Kubernetes API server. So when you have this CLI where you're saying, hey, deploy function, you're actually talking to the uh, Kubernetes API server directly. Uh, we reuse Kubernetes API objects. So everything we do with our function, it's a, you know, it's a deployment, we're reusing services, we're reusing config maps, we reuse ingress to basically you know, have some sort of API gateway to, to the functions. For the famous auto-scaling of the, of the functions, we use the Kubernetes horizontal pod auto-scaler you know, automatically. For monitoring of the functions, we use Prometheus, so you know, CNCF project. And then there was also a good question earlier. I didn't want to you know, cut the, uh, the, the conversation. But in the future, next six months, we're going to use Istio or Envoy directly to basically provide traffic encryption between functions. It's a natural you know, addition to, to Kubeless so that we have this very nice you know, traffic uh, shaping, routing you know, between uh, functions and then encryption and also distributed tracing. Okay? So all of those CNCF projects marry very well, and especially you know, with Kubeless, which is an extension of Kubernetes. Uh, what does it mean to extend Kubernetes? It means that we're using this object, which is called a custom resource definition, a CRD. It used to be called a third-party resource, but now it's, uh, since 1.8, it's a CRD. 
With CRD, what you can do is you can actually define a new custom object, and the Kubernetes API is going to create a new REST uh, endpoint, okay? So it's actually magic. The first time I heard about it, I was like, what is, what is this? How, you know, it was, uh, it was a bit weird, but you try it, you know, it takes really two minutes to try. Uh, you create a new custom resource definition. Let's say you want Kubernetes to manage bananas. You create a custom resource definition for bananas. And then automatically your kubectl knows bananas. So you do kubectl get banana and it, it returns things. Okay? So CRDs are like super powerful. So that's what we've done with Kubeless. We do a custom resource definition. We've defined a function object. And now suddenly Kubernetes you know, is aware of function. kubectl get functions. You get functions back. Okay? Uh, of course, using a CRD, you know, and defining a CRD in itself in Kubernetes, uh, you know, it's a, it's a five-minute exercise. You have to think about your spec, but it's actually quite easy. The hard part is to write the controller, okay? So you need to write some code that's going to watch this new REST endpoint, and then when, you know, you have update on this uh, REST endpoint, you actually do things. So we create the function, and then we have the controller that's saying, oh, there's a new function being created. Now what do I do? Well, what do you do? You create a deployment, which will then create pods, and then those pods will get the function injected in them. That's where there is a little bit of magic of injecting the function. Okay, how do you inject a function dynamically inside a pod? And we use config map. Uh, to be honest, it's a little bit of a hack. Okay, I mean, uh, you know, you have the little script, you have you have your uh, your business logic. Uh, the controller is going to stick that business logic in a config map, and then you just do a volume mount, okay? So it's a little bit of a hack. We are working on actually having a, a much cleaner build pipeline so that we can also handle dependencies of the functions properly. Right now, we handle dependencies, but a little bit of a suboptimal uh, way. Now, if you're trying to write a controller, there are now lots of uh, good documentation out there, you, you know, actually also from, uh, from Bitnami, but you know, pay attention to the, the Google project uh, Cube Meta Controller. Uh, it's still totally beta, but it's supposed to be a, a framework to help you write controllers, okay? So it's just a, a little shout out. So you know, keep, keep an eye on, uh, on Cube Meta Controller and definitely the, the concept of extending Kubernetes with CRDs and writing controllers. Uh, how do we do monitoring? So that's where you know, I, 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 liked, um, I like Prometheus because Prometheus has a client, so you can instrument all your business code, all your, uh, all your code directly with the Prometheus client. We're not monitoring from the outside in the function. We're actually you know, monitoring the function itself. So if you, if you peek at the, at the code for our runtime, you'll see that we use the Prometheus client in Python, in Ruby, or whatever, to actually be able to measure directly at the pod level the number of function calls, the number of failures, the, the latency of the function calls, and so on. Once we do this, Prometheus is able to scrape all of those metrics and, uh, and return everything back. So we build cute dashboards. <laughs> so you end up with a dashboard like this. That's just the basic example. You get number of, you know, of uh, function call rate. You get uh, failures, of course, zero failures, uh, and then you know, duration of the, uh, of the execution. But the point, you know, dashboards are, uh, are cute and, you know, the, the managers, they love the dashboard, but uh, uh, really what, why we were doing this uh, instrumentation of the runtime is to be able to give you auto-scaling because that's key for our serverless. We need to have a way to, you know, scale those functions uh, automatically. And of course, Kubernetes has auto-scaling built in. Again, Kubeless is Kubernetes native, so we reuse everything. So how do you set up uh, auto-scaling uh, in Kubernetes? By default, it's going to auto-scale based on CPU. Uh, but you can do auto-scaling based on custom metrics. So, so since we have instrumented our runtime, we can now, our controller can now create an HPA automatically, which is going to use the number of you know, requests per second to be able to scale based on QPS, okay? So you have auto-scaling auto uh, out of it. It's a little bit tricky because configuring Kubernetes right now to use custom metrics is a, it's a, little, bit of a little bit of work. 
And then the last bit that we wanted to do is that you know, serverless is not, a, is not a fad. If you go to a serverless conference, we, you'll see that serve, uh, Lambda and Google Cloud Functions and so on actually has lots of users. And already production users, companies in production with serverless, okay? Uh, interestingly, what most of those users are using is this framework, which is called serverless framework. It's very confusing. Serverless.com is a startup that has created the serverless.com. It's written in Node.js, but their Twitter handle is Go Serverless. <laughs> okay? But they've done a really amazing job basically creating a, you know, a spec common to all the, uh, well, it's not exactly a spec, but uh, an interface common to all the uh, cl uh, cloud uh, function providers. Okay? So most of the users that do uh, Lambda and Cloud Functions and so on, they use this framework to deploy their, uh, their functions. So Kubeless, we've created you know, one of the, the fifth provider of the, the serverless uh, framework. So you know, I, I, I'm not, I, have not, I haven't really talked about application pipelines. Uh, what time is it? Okay, I got, I got time. Uh, but I felt like it was important to explain the system so that you see you know, what how is kubeless uh, created so that you, you understand it. And the strengths of being Kubernetes native is that since you are now operating your Kubernetes clusters, you install kubeless. If something goes wrong or you need, you know, you need to manage it, you, it's just, those are just pods. They are deployments. They are services, ingress rules, HPAs. You know how to, uh, you know, how to take care of those. Uh, but now let's talk about applications. And you know, for me, the, the, the key with serverless was to build, to compose an application made of multiple services. It's almost like, you know, mashup, you know, 10.0 or whatever. So back in, so when was that, 98 or whatever, when there was mashups. Uh, but here we are trying to build, you know, a mashup of uh, a database service and then uh, an archive service and then, a, you know, a, a stream, event streaming service. And we are trying to compose all those uh, services together to build a bigger app, okay? Scalable, distributed, and so on. So how can you build this app? Uh, if you try to go from scratch, it's going to be like super complicated to, to, to make it happen. But we need to have a way to basically say, hey, provision this database, provision this streaming service, this archiving, uh, uh, this object store, and so on, and then write this business logic to be able to tie everything together, okay? Uh, so in some ways, serverless is about stitching services together. So again, we go back to, uh, to Lambda, and the examples that they have are you know, fairly straightforward, but they have, they have quite, a, quite a few of them. And they, the philosophy that we have adopted with Kubeless is to actually try to enable all those pipelines that uh, Lambda is talking about. So that's a fairly, fairly simple one. You have pictures, you put them in buckets, uh, you know, in S3 buckets, and as soon as the, the, the image is in the bucket, it triggers a function that generates a thumbnail. Thumbnail creator, okay? So it's, it's pretty, pretty easy. So that type of app. Uh, another type of app is that you have a Kinesis stream, of course, so you have like, you know, Twitter stream or uh, events coming, uh, you know, from your, from your enterprise. And then you're, uh, you're calling lambdas when there are events in those streams and sticking everything into a database, okay? Uh, those are you know, fairly simple, but if you're trying to build that from scratch, it, it, it could be actually uh, quite, uh, quite daunting. So Kubeless allows you to do this. And you know, the, the vision was in Kubernetes, if we need to deploy something that looks like Kinesis or something like, that looks like DynamoDB, you know, we, we can probably reuse an application that's been created by somebody else, okay? And right now, there's something that's quite useful. It may evolve, but right now it's quite useful. We have Helm charts, okay? So if you want a database, or if you want an Elasticsearch uh, cluster, or if you want a you know, Kafka cluster, you can actually say Helm install Elasticsearch, and you'll get your Elasticsearch cluster. Helm install MySQL, you'll get MySQL, okay? So imagine this app, and you have Services, 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 and by service I mean you know a big app. Helm install those bits, and you could deploy them a different way. But I'm just using Helm as an example. So you install all of those separately with Helm, and now you write your business logic with uh, with Kubeless. Okay. So Kinesis, DynamoDB, Helm install, and then you know the Lambda in the middle, you know Kubeless. So 
those are actually quite hard to demo, I have to be honest, because they, they get kind of involved in, a, in doing all the deployment you know, in, in five minutes and so on. So I invite you to go to our, our function store, which is you know, on GitHub, github.com, kubeless functions, and you'll see some interesting pipelines there, like you know, one that I like is like an OCR pipeline, optical character recognition. Drop an image in a Minio object store, the image is in your Minio object store, Minio can send events to a Kafka message broker. Okay, you receive that and then uh, send that to Apache Tika, which does OCR. And then once the OCR is done, you store that in MongoDB. Okay, so three services Minio Object Store, uh, what did I say? MongoDB and Apache Tika. So those three services, you can deploy them with Helm or you know, another way. Uh, that's how, that's uh, that's what what we what we show in this uh, in this repo here, and then you write a function that is able to to do the the OCR pipeline. Okay, it actually works you know very well, and it's quite you know it's quite impressive. The other uh, example that you can find on there that I really love is um, be able to uh, to stream a database uh, events. So let's say you have a MySQL uh, database and you do insert, delete, whatever, and then you want to get uh, a message where every time there is an insert or a delete or an update, right? So you can use a project from Red Hat, which is Dibisium. So look at, look at Dibisium. Uh, basically, it installs MySQL, but connected to Kafka, okay? So when you do an insert, it will then you know, send an image to a, a Kafka topic, and then this Kafka topic, this message on the Kafka topic can trigger your function, okay? So we have an example where you, know, you, you do inserts, delete, whatever, and then it streams that uh, to Slack, okay? So I mean, probably not mega useful to stream that to Slack, but you get the idea of this, this stream. And the reason why from the start we went with, uh, so Kubeless underneath also has a little uh, Kafka broker for, uh, for development. So you, when you install Kubeless, you get the a, a working Kafka uh, setup. The reason why we went with Kafka is that Kafka has a set of plugins, Kafka Connect, and you can you know, basically stream from a database or stream from other types of services. So it's kind of handy. And also because the enterprise you know, is, uh, is using Kafka a lot. Okay, so those are, those are a little bit complicated to, uh, to demo, but I thought, you know, I cannot, I cannot do this talk without giving you a demo. So you guys want a demo? Yeah, yeah. okay. Cool, so shout out to those, those guys, Katakoda. You know, you, you know Katakoda? Yeah? No, you don't know Katakoda? Okay, so you have to, you have to check them out. Team Katakoda, you get lots of uh, online scenarios to, to learn things. Uh, so it's kind of it's kind of handy. I, I'm gonna try to make that bigger. So we just worked on. Can you see that in the back? I don't think I can make that. Okay. So it's all, you know, it's all online. You could you could get to it. It's katakoda.com/slash/kubeless/slash/scenarios/slash/getting started. So here, what's happening is that uh, there is a VM somewhere in a cloud being created, or that has been already created. It's running this script automatically when you start the scenario, and it's just setting up uh, Kubernetes. Here you go. So we have a we have a Kubernetes cluster, and it's in my browser. But I have a you know I have basically have a shell. So get nodes. I have you know one one node basically. Uh, can I clear the screen? Here you go. So to install Kubeless, you create a namespace Kubeless, and then you just you know uh, kubectl create uh, this this stuff here. So what's happening here is that we're just getting a manifest from GitHub. So we're, when we release Kubeless, we create a manifest that contains the, you know, the, everything that Kubeless needs to run. And then we pipe that through uh, kubectl create. Okay? It's, a, it's actually a very nice way to, to, de to, deploy, uh, to deploy stuff. Uh, and then if I, look at the, if I look at my pods after having uh, you know, done this kubectl create, you should see that I have a controller here that's pending, and you see my little Kafka you know, setup with Zookeeper. This is not meant for production. This is just so that by default, when you install Kubeless, you have uh, an event uh, you know, message broker, so that if you deploy services that can send events to Kafka, you can start building those pipelines, okay? 
So Minio, the object store, for example, you can configure it to, to push notification to, uh, to Kafka. Uh, once the, uh, so you see that now my controller is running, uh, so I click continue, and here is the CLI that I didn't want to type, so that's why I'm showing you the, the Katakoda stuff. So kubeless function deploy dash runtime, so we're deploying a Python function handler from file, that's where you actually have your file, so if I do a more, uh, more toy, I have like the, you know, really uh, silly uh, function, it's just doing an echo of the event. And this CLI, uh, we started by mimicking 100% the Google Cloud Function CLI, and then actually we started, you know, doing a mistake. We started mixing it with a little bit of AWS, so it's not, you know, we, we need to clean that up at, uh, at some point. So here, uh, let, me, let me do this. You know, I deploy, it's deploy, now I do kubeless function ls, and it's telling me, okay, so I need to kubeless function ls, there you go. So it's telling me that the function is deployed. Uh, and then what has happened underneath, you know, is that the controller has detected the controller has de detected the function and then created a deployment, created a service, in created the config map, injected the, the script inside the, uh, the, the stuff. If, you, if we want to look at the, uh, you know, get custom resource definitions, yeah, so you see uh, functions, and you could actually do everything through, uh, through kubectl, because kubectl is now aware of functions, and Kubernetes now has a function object, so you could write a manifest for your function. So if you don't like the kubeless CLI, okay, no, you know, no offense taken, just use kubectl, okay? <laughs> So let's, let's look at it. Now it's, it's running, great. So, and now we can, we can call the function. So great, hello world is returned. So function call toy, you pass in a little uh, JSON and it returns hello world, okay? Great, that's, that's the very basic. And that's, that's fun, right? It's, it's triggered by HTTP, it's cool. But actually the most interesting part is to trigger this function through events, through you know, Kafka or pot potentially things like Nats or RabbitMQ and things like this. Uh, you can get the logs of the event, kubeless function logs, that's basically kubectl logs. You can describe you know, the function, you get the, the function object. You can also update on the fly, you know, of course. Uh, so I'm going to, I'm going to skip the uh, update. And you could do, you could do uh, Node.js, of course. We support Ruby and, uh, and uh, dot Microsoft contributed .NET Core. So you could, you could uh, uh, deploy uh, Ruby if you wanted to. Uh, so I'm going, I'm going, oh no. So I'm going to skip because it looks like you guys are following and you get, you get the idea. One point I want to make is that we can also deploy custom runtime. Okay, that means that we have our built-in runtime, but if you bring your own runtime, which has your function already packaged in your Docker image, uh, we can run that, you know, runtime. And it's an interesting discussion uh, to have. We may not have time here, but basically as long as you have a Docker container that exposes a function over HTTP on port 8080, then you have a function. And that's more or less what OpenFast does. So here, if you look at this line, kubeless function deploy, I'm going to actually launch an OpenFast, an OpenFast function through kubeless. Kubeless function deploy, runtime image, I'm just specifying one of their function, which is the uh, markdown renderer, right? So I deploy this. If I look at my pods, you know, my pod is going to, uh, okay, so now the function is running. And now I call that open fast function through my kubeless uh, CLI, and it's just like a, you know, a small, like, they call it markdown render. Uh, it, does, it doesn't matter really what the function does for the, this purpose, but the point is that any open fast function runs in this because an open fast function is really just a container. Okay, one, one demo that, that I wanted to, uh, to show you is actually uh, about those events, right? Because that, that's the key for building those pipelines. And I was 
talking with one of the uh, AWS hero, Ben Kehoe from iRobotics, and he's like, wow, you really need to integrate with SQS, the, uh, the AWS queuing system. So here, I'm on a, my AWS console. I've created a FIFO queue on SQS, okay? And I'm going to publish events uh, into that queue, okay? And I'm going to go to my terminal, and I'm going to show you uh, the manifest of a function. So here is the manifest of a function. So you see my function, my business logic is actually here, like in the middle, function. But then this is actually a Kubernetes manifest. This is a function object. So KLS.IOV1, kind function, metadata. I have some dependencies that are actually specified. So the, the pod is actually going to pre-install some dependencies. And then the code actually talks to the Kubernetes API to get some secrets. <clears throat> so here I'm going to get some secrets, uh, some Twitter keys. So I'm going to basically try to publish an image in, the, in my AWS SQS console. I'm going to publish a, a message. And then this function is going to send that message to my Twitter stream. OK? Make sense? So to be able to publish to my Twitter stream, I need this function to be able to load my uh, you know, Twitter uh, secrets. And then, you know, obviously, that's the one that I shouldn't have showed you. Okay, test, here you go. There is something really hackish about this because I did this last week, which is that to be able to talk to SQS, you need to have your AWS keys, <laughs> which, I, which I put as environmental variable. This is bad, okay? So I have to ask the, uh, well, okay, I can just revoke the keys after this. Um, that, that's fine. Um, so this is bad, but it, 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 it brings a, an interesting point about authentication of the function which was asked before. So here what we want to do is be able to use uh, kube2im. We want to use an IM profile so that you, know, uh, you have proper authentication. And we need authentication different ways. We need authentication to who calls the function, and we need to be able to give authentication to what the function can do. Okay? But Kubernetes is, you know, can do this you know, with, uh, on Google and, uh, and on AWS. So we can use the instance metadata to get YAM profile and so on. So, long, st long story. Let's do kubectl. I'm going to create the function now, not through, uh, not through the uh, kubeless CLI, but through the kube control command, because I, I just, I've, I've written a, a function uh, manifest, right? Okay kubectl get pods. So you see that it's actually running a, an init container. That's, some, that's something we need to, we need to uh, you know, change to be able to uh, uh, reduce the, uh, the startup time. And then I'm going to go here and then, uh, what I'm going to do here from the console is I can do send message Hey, kubecon rocks, and then we need to put some message to duplication. Okay, so the message is ready to being sent. Is the pod running? The pod is running. So that, that pod should be receiving my message from my SQS queue because it's, it's listening to my SQS uh, queue. There is, you know, that our runtime automatically does this. Our runtime automatically, you know, can, can connect to SQS and, um, and, uh, and get messages. It's basically an SQS trigger. And okay, so we go here, and then somebody checks my Twitter time, uh, timeline. Okay, should be KubeCon rocks. That's what I sent. Did it go through? Yeah? There you go. Okay. KubeCon rocks. Sent. Woo! <laughs> so it's just, just to give you an idea of what we can do, right? We can have all those event sources that basically uh, can trigger functions and then compose, you know, serv services. So that's... It's a, it's a fun little uh, exercise, but we can build much more complicated pipeline. Uh, I'm going to skip the... Uh, 
What's going on? Ah, there you go. I'm going to skip the, the last, uh, okay, I did the SQS demo. I'm going to skip this one, but I mean, I, can, I, I, could, I could show it to you, okay? The idea here is that Kelsey this morning said, we don't want to do things through the CLI. And I agree with you. We want to automate things. You know, we want to do things directly in version control. And I came out and I was like, yes, he's totally right. But in Kubeless, I can write a Kubernetes manifest. So how do I keep uh, basically updating that manifest when I change the code of my function in a very declarative manner? Well, it's very simple. You stick your function, well, very simple, no, sorry. You stick, your, you stick your function in version control, and then you start doing you know, pull requests and updating that code. And now what's going to update that function? Well, I have a little cron job, a Kubernetes cron job, that uh, you know, every minute is going to git pull my repo with my function code, sees the new code, and then, then does a kubectl apply of the function manifest. It just works. So I have a CD pipeline for functions, thanks to Kubernetes cron job and kubeless. Okay, it works. It's super. Uh, it's super cool and super small. So now we have two, three minutes, and I'd like to uh, to have Arjun uh, come here, and then he's going to uh, tell us a little bit about how they use uh, kubeless at uh, BlackRock. I'm just gonna hang on to this. Um, first off, thank you, Sebastian, for uh, letting us uh, speak here. This is an awesome audience, and we are very excited to be here. Um, my name is Arjun Rao, and I am from BlackRock. For those of you who do not know BlackRock, we are the world's largest asset manager, and we manage nearly $6 trillion in assets under management. Um, I am the engineering lead of serverless compute at BlackRock. Um, at BlackRock, we have a very rigorous culture of questioning our assumptions and basically evaluating every line of code in order to make sure that we are driving innovation on behalf of our clients. And our use of Kubeless is just another example of this. Uh, my team personally builds products for portfolio managers and investor research teams so that they are able to search and discover data sets which they can use to power their investment research. And now, in order to have an effective search engine, it's also very essential to have a rich index that is easily searchable. And one of the ways that you can have a rich index is by enriching any kind of data that exists in this index. Now, we build our index using the metadata that is associated with these data sets, so it's only natural that we find a way to enhance the metadata that exists um, as part of these data sets. Now, in order to enhance this metadata, we need our developers to have a way to plug in scalable and customizable functions that they can use uh, to translate this metadata. And this is where Kubeless comes in. Uh, what Kubeless um, lets our developers do is basically apply their business logic at any part of the data processing pipeline. And this, the declarative mechanism of uh, defining Kubeless functions frees them from having to worry about how to deploy functions, how to orchestrate functions, and any of those uh, uh, nightmares that developers have to face, and they can solely focus on business logic um, and basically building out a more rich and expressive um, index that can be used to evaluate uh, res result sets that can be sent back to the users who are looking for these data sets. Uh, we are very excited to be active users of Kubeless, and thank you so much for your time. Thanks, Arjun. Yeah, pretty excited too. So Thanks a lot. Uh, please reach out to us if you have any questions. Uh, we're just on time or a couple minutes left. Check out Kubeless and CubeApps also from Bitnami. And 4.30, come get a book, 25 books only. Woo. Thank you. Thank you.